On this episode of Famous Families, The Lees, America's first family of martial arts. Featuring rare footage from Bruce Lee's years as a child actor in Hong Kong. Exclusive interviews with family members and close friends. And he held out his arm like that and pow, knocked me back out of the chair. I said, when do we start, man? <laughs> Photos and home movies from the Lee's private family collection. Choice clips showing the Lee's at their fighting best. And the story behind the shocking death of Bruce Lee. Finally, I asked someone, is he alive? And they just shook their head. And the tragedy of his only son, Brandon. Find out why their legend lives on and why their fighting spirit continues to inspire fans the world over. All this and more, up next on Famous Families. martial arts action films crossed racial, social, and cultural boundaries. Small wonder that his family did the same. The Lees are a blend of East and West, pride and passion, mind and body. But more than that, you'll soon see that they're a family that embodies the very best of the American dream, that anyone can accomplish anything they set their mind to. Bruce Lee, the world's premier martial arts hero. At a time when Hollywood offered few roles to Asians, Bruce broke through the cultural barriers. His good looks, speed, and swagger remain the standard to which all other martial artists are compared. Bruce's son, Brandon Lee, carried on in his father's footsteps, becoming the young martial arts hero of the 90s. And like his father, he died a senseless and tragic death. Shannon Lee now continues the legacy, embarking on an action career of her own. And finally, Linda Lee, the mother of his children and the love of his life. Linda remains the cornerstone of the Lee family, keeping Bruce's memory and philosophy alive. How and where did this martial arts legacy begin? He was born in San Francisco in 1940 when his parents happened to be touring with the Chinese Opera Company. Bruce's father, Lei Hoichun, was an actor in the Chinese Opera, so they happened to be on tour when Bruce was born in San Francisco. But at the age of three months, he did return to Hong Kong, and he had this nickname in Hong Kong. They called him Never Sit Still, you know. And uh, he also was given a nickname by his family, a term of endearment. He was called Sai Fong. This name in English means little peacock or little phoenix. But it was the name given the baby by a San Francisco doctor that the world would come to know him as Bruce. Just as the child's name was a blend of East and West, so were his parents. My father was a very traditional Chinese gentleman. He uh, instilled in us a lot of respect for, of course, yourself, the family, your siblings. We had a lot of people in our household. There were five of us kids. Uh, my father was all Chinese, and my mom was half Chinese, half Caucasian. Because of the intermingling and so forth, we were all brought up, you know, that, uh, telling us in a way, not because somebody told us, because we just felt that um, there is no boundaries, no cultural boundaries, no people boundaries. Bruce was an active child whose boundless energy led to his becoming a popular child actor with a style all his own. Hey, kid, bring it here. Right. Here you are, sir. Uh. You like that, Shannon? Uh-huh. I sure wish I could throw a knife like that. His father made numerous Cantonese films, and Bruce must have been just a natural, and his father must have recognized this, because throughout his childhood, Bruce was involved in the film business, and he made 20 films as a child actor. He was a born showman. <laughs> there were a lot of trademarks that are evident in his younger films, the thumbing of the nose, the, the, uh, the grimacing to someone when he's mad. Uh, the, the walk, even. If you look at the way he walks, it's almost a strut. But he, that was Bruce from, you know, age six through to age 32. They always had that. 
Despite Bruce's success as a child actor, he never felt completely at ease in Hong Kong. For the first uh, four years of his life, Hong Kong was occupied by Japanese forces during World War II, from 41 to 45. His very early memory is of leaning way over his balcony and shaking his fist in the sky at the Japanese airplanes going over. So those are among his very first memories, of course, reinforced later on by the fact that Hong Kong, his home, was ruled by a foreign power, the British. Bruce acted out his resentments by picking fights with British students and sometimes Chinese students as well. Soon, he became the object of resentment. Because of his cockiness, people didn't, you know, really like the way he was, you know, acting. So um, they came out one day, and a whole bunch of, you know, other students just came up and beat the heck out of him. <laughs> and then from that day on, I noticed that he begins to tell himself or ask himself, "Hey, can I do something to protect myself?" Bruce and his parents agreed that martial arts would be a worthwhile pursuit. But while Li Hoi Chun encouraged his son to pursue a traditional nonviolent art form such as Tai Chi, Bruce hungered for something geared more towards practical combat. He befriended some people and ended up running around with some friends who were members of a style called Wing Chun. And what he liked about Wing Chun was that it was not ornate, it didn't stress form and tradition, it was really geared toward efficient street fighting, and that was exactly what he was looking for. Bruce's Wing Chun instructor, a highly respected master named Yip Man, was impressed by Bruce's rapid physical development. But he also sensed his students' inner turmoil. Eventually, Yip Man asked Bruce to take time off from practice to work on his spiritual awareness. Bruce reluctantly complied. He took a Chinese junk out into the, I guess what would have been the harbor in Hong Kong, and just went out there to be by himself. And he just got mad at himself, and he punched the water. And right then, he had a, a vision, or at least a, a sartori of sorts, an awakening, that that's exactly what the teacher was talking about. You have to be able to give like water. You have to be able to adapt like water. And in time, this principle would become the cornerstone of Bruce Lee's approach to life. But as a headstrong teenager, he still carried a large chip on his shoulder. Because of a lot of fights, uh, when he got to about, uh, about 17 or 18, the cops were more or less coming after him. They asked the headmaster to call my mom out there to meet them, which she did. And at that point, uh, they told her that, hey, you know, if your son don't stop now, you know, we're gonna have to throw him in jail very soon. So my mom got a little don't know what to do type situation. So she went back and talked to my dad. They had this very serious discussion. And they said, well, it's best that Bruce go back to America to change his environment. In April of 1959, the 18-year-old set off to live with family friends in San Francisco. For the tough street fighter, this was a time of doubt and vulnerability. We started to leave, and at that point, Bruce, of course, you know, he's that kind of a, you know, manly type, you know, trying to hold, hold himself together. But I could tell the change in his eyes, you know, his facial features that, hey, you know, this is starting to change. My life's starting to change. During the three long weeks it took for the ship to cross the Pacific, Bruce was plagued by discomfort, worry, and self-doubt. He came over in, in one of the, you know, the lower class accommodations on a ship, and uh, he shared with me that he was, you know, seasick quite a bit of the time, and uh, he, I think he was really uh, apprehensive as to what he was getting into over here. Shortly after coming to the United States, he moved to Seattle. He then went to Edison Technical School in Seattle and achieved his diploma credentials so that he could be admitted to the University of Washington. Bruce majored in philosophy at the university while continuing to practice martial arts. His skills so impressed his fellow students that some began asking him to teach. You know, I used to run around in front of him and kick telephone posts and stuff and trying to impress him and then one day I walked up and asked him if his name was Bruce Lee. He said yes and I said, um, you teach Kung Fu? And he said yes. I said, would you like to teach me? As a teacher, Bruce took what he had learned in Hong Kong and combined it with both Western concepts and theories of his own. This approach was a radical departure from Chinese tradition. He said basically it is man's quest for knowledge. 
is on and quest for the wisdom and knowledge in martial art. And that's what he, what he stressed with me when he trained me. Very, very uh, physical instructor, but also very, uh, very philosophical instructor. Bruce named his new approach Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist. One of Bruce's early students was a college freshman named Linda Emery. I was very taken by the martial arts, but even more so by the instructor. One fall day in 1963, Bruce and Linda were practicing together on campus. He let me throw him to the ground, and so I did, and so I had him down on the ground, and he said, how would you like to go to the Space Needle? And I said, wow, you mean all of us? We're all gonna go to the Space Needle? You know, Space Needle had just been there since the World's Fair the year before. And he said, no, just you. I said, wow, whoo, boom, boom, boom. Linda and Bruce's relationship quickly blossomed into a serious romance. Bruce's parents, themselves an interracial couple, blessed the union. Some members of Linda's family, however, had trouble accepting Bruce. We did discuss this quite at length about the difference in our cultures and the family problems that it created. But between Bruce and me, it was always actually an opportunity to share each other's cultures. On August 17th, 1964, Bruce and Linda were married, joining together man and woman, east and west. Together, they would launch Bruce on the path towards stardom. Soon after they were married in 1964, Bruce and Linda Lee moved to Oakland, California. Bruce opened a second school of martial arts where he taught his revolutionary style to any and all who were willing to learn. That too was revolutionary. At that time, it, was, it wasn't uh, the proper thing to teach a person that was not Chinese Kung Fu, and he was one of the first to, to break into that barrier. Bruce's skills and his philosophy continued to grow and to evolve into an all-encompassing way of life. Ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. Now, it is very difficult to do. I mean, it, it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky yeah. and be flooded with a cocky feeling and then yeah. feel like pretty cool and all that. Or I can f make all kinds of phony things, you see what I mean? Blinded by it. Or I can show you some f really fancy movement. But to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, that, my friend, is <laughs> very hard to do. At home, Bruce and Linda's marriage reflected their life philosophy, that their union was one of hearts, minds, and souls. His idea was that the man and the woman are not opposites. They don't play opposite roles, but rather complementary roles. He cherished his relationship with Linda. He, says, I, he told me that he thought he was the most luckiest man in the world because he had Linda uh, as his wife. On February 1st, 1965, all of the Lees' love and joy burst forth in the form of their first child, Brandon Bruce Lee. He just came out fighting, you know? He just had a real personality from the moment he was born, and he let everybody know about it. He didn't sleep through the night till he was 18 months old. Bruce was very proud of Brandon, and he'd always tell me how he had him doing the sidekicks and all these kind of things, you know? And, and uh, Bruce was, was really a family man. Bruce and Linda had only one week to celebrate Brandon's birth before news arrived that Bruce's father, Lee Hoi Chun, had died. Utterly devastated, Bruce returned to Hong Kong to mourn his father's passing. At that point, I guess Bruce realized how his father has helped him to become who he was and all the Chinese tradition that was instilled in him, and he really missed him a lot. So when he came, came back, he was really crying, I mean, loudly. Bruce's emotions were wrenched in another direction when, while in the middle of mourning, he received an unexpected phone call from Hollywood. The call was the result of a martial arts exhibition Bruce had given months before. Bruce came out and demonstrated Gung Fu, from one-finger push-ups to one-inch punches to, to being able to spar somebody blindfolded. Uh, this is what you can do if you train your body to be very sensitive and, and to the peak of athletic condition. And no one in America at that point had seen anything like that. A film of the tournament ended up in the hands of Hollywood producer William Dozier, who needed an Asian actor for a TV action series he was developing. Dozier took one look at Bruce's skills and charisma and knew he'd found his man. 
Test X2, take one. Speed. Start off. Hey! There is band arm strike using the waist again into a back fit. And uh, let's have the assistant director back up just the waist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. In the winter of 1965, 25-year-old Bruce Lee was cast as Cato, the crime-fighting sidekick to the Green Hornet, played by Van Williams. The Green Hornet debuted in September of 1966. He was, uh very light on his feet and uh, also his speed and also his strength for a guy his size because he wasn't very big and there was a lot of things that he could do that that just kind of amazed me the cameramen were equally amazed when they discovered that filming bruce when he was moving at full speed was practically impossible because he was dressed in all black it, it was not so much as a blur you just couldn't see him i mean he was so fast you really couldn't see what was going on the show drew a small but enthusiastic audience. Purely by accident, Bruce Lee had become a TV star. Everybody would come over and say, wow, cool, you know, everything, you know, that's your brother and stuff like that, you know. And my mom would watch it and, of course, I mean, all of us were so thrilled. It was a short-lived thrill. We're not needed here anymore. The Green Hornet was canceled after only one season. And even though Bruce received most of the show's fan mail, he wasn't offered other roles. Instead of talent agents calling him with work, Hollywood's biggest stars were calling him for kung fu lessons. He said, I got one hit punch that's better than anything you ever did. I said, oh, really? Yeah. I said, well, I'll show it to you. He said, okay, stand up. I stood up and he held three pillows in front of me, and he held out his arm like that and found like that, knocked me back out of the chair, rolled over three times over in the corner, and the room was large. It was a big room. I made about three, three heads over heels, one inch. I said, pew! That's when do we start, man. <laughs> Bruce's celebrity students also included Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Steve McQueen. It was always a very important time to him uh, when you were working out, and he always wanted to make the most use of his time. Your time together with him, you really had to be like, you had to have done your homework and be ready to, to go. McQueen was such a competitor, you know, he was always, you know, he's, he always really wanted to hit him. He always really wanted to do it to him, you know, he could never touch him. You know? <laughs> Though Bruce enjoyed teaching, he grew increasingly frustrated with being stereotyped. The few small acting roles he got were always as a martial arts instructor, and Bruce knew he was capable of much more. Bruce and I discussed a, a number of times uh, the problems of dealing with racial stereotypes. Uh, he had to deal with the ones that affected Asian Americans, which uh, I did not know a lot about personally. Uh, I only knew about it superficially, but I could talk to him in depth about the ones that affected African Americans, and uh, it was more or less the same story. Bruce's response to Hollywood stereotyping of Asians was to create a role for himself that would provide both an income for his family and dignity for his culture. In the United States, I think something about the Oriental, the, I mean, the true Oriental should be shown. Well, he said, uh, I want to do something to uplift the image of my people. He said, uh, look at what, what you see in the American movies. He said, you see the Chinaman in these Westerns or something like that with his hands and his sleeves and his pigtail, and, and he just stand there like a monument or something. All he says is chop, chop, and he said, uh, it's not right. He said, I want to try to do something to create equality among mankind. His hope on television was, was to explore the higher principles of the martial arts through a weekly television series. And his idea was a show called Here Comes the Warrior, later shortened to The Warrior, about a Shaolin or, or classically trained martial artist in America. Bruce Lee's project eventually aired on network television as the hit drama series Kung Fu. But in a bitter irony, the producers rejected Bruce for the role of the lead character because they considered him too Asian. When he was not offered the role, and he was told that he was not offered the role because he was not bankable, because an Asian person would not be bankable as a leading man in a television series. That was a serious blow, because he hadn't realized, really, the extent 
of the prejudice in the business. Since Bruce's income from teaching martial arts was too low to support a wife and child, Linda helped out by taking minimum wage jobs. Her love and support were an important solace for Bruce during this difficult time. Then, in April of 1969, Linda gave birth to their daughter, Shannon Lee. It's like, you know, every time he holds Shannon, I remember he's like holding, you know, like cuddling a little flower, you know. He was all into it, just like cuddling a little puppy, you know. I mean, you know, he was all, he was melting away. <laughs> he was just swept off his feet, I think you might say. He didn't really realize the impact that a little baby girl would have on him. And she was just the apple of his eye. She was so darling. It was, as I've said before, it, it was like an angel came to live at our house. Shannon's birth made Bruce only more determined to prove that he was not only a great martial artist, but a great actor as well. He had made a cassette tape, which he played to himself every night, telling him what he wants to be. And at that point, uh, he, played, he played it to me, and what he wanted to be was to be the highest paid actor in Hollywood. By 1971, Bruce Lee had spent five difficult and discouraging years trying to build an acting career in America. On the positive side, he continued to develop his martial art of Jeet Kune Do. Most importantly, his family was thriving. We had, I guess, the typical brother-sister relationship. Um, you know, we used to sort of torture each other as much as possible, and I was the, as a, I'm sure he would disagree, but I was the young, innocent, gullible one who was, um, you know, taken advantage of by the evil brother. In 1971, Bruce visited Hong Kong to bring his mother back to join the rest of the family in California. When he arrived in Asia, he was amazed to discover that not only did he have millions of fans from his Green Hornet days, but they had renamed it The Cato Show in his honor. Bruce was the first, viewed as the first product from Hong Kong. We said, hey, you know what, it's okay to be Chinese, and Chinese people are just as good as anybody else. Within months of his triumphant return to Hong Kong, Bruce was approached by Asia's most powerful and prolific film producer, Raymond Chow. I called him on the phone, and we started a conversation. The whole thing clicks. Then uh, we signed a three-picture deal, and he came back, and the rest is history. Bruce's first major starring role was in a small-budget martial arts film called The Big Boss. The Big Boss broke all previous Asian box office records. The reaction was so fantastic, so tremendous, to the point that the audience, I said, was sort of dumbfounded at the end of the thing and really wait for quite a few seconds, which not only to Bruce, but to a few of us, seems like a year until everybody broke out into a thunderous uh, applause. For the Lee family, the film's success meant a new start and a new life. When it was a sure thing that Bruce was going to go ahead and make the second movie in Hong Kong, then he said, we're moving to Hong Kong. It helped our children to realize that their heritage is Chinese and American. So they had that exposure there as very small children. And I went to an all Chinese school and uh, wore my little uniform and my little backpack to school even at the age of three. They start pretty young there. <laughs> Bruce's second film released in the United States as The Chinese Connection was an even bigger success. With just two films, Bruce Lee had become the world's first Chinese action film star. Everyone viewed him as one of their own. And the interesting thing about it is that it, it cut across all cultures. It wasn't just Chinese, it wasn't just, it wasn't Japanese, it wasn't just Asians. It was African Americans, it was Canadians, it was Caucasians. It was everybody felt something about Bruce. Most gratifying for Bruce was that his philosophy of flowing around obstacles like water had proven successful. He had overcome the shame of living in an occupied country and honored his ancestors by creating a positive Chinese role model that all people could relate to. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, 
it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Bruce wrote, directed, and choreographed his third film, Return of the Dragon. He even played percussion on the film's soundtrack. For his next film, Game of Death, Bruce enlisted the aid of his closest friends and students. He uh, got in touch with me and asked me to come to Hong Kong. Uh, maybe we could shoot some scenes for a movie. I was flabbergasted, you know, I, this is something that we had dreamed about. Bruce's work on Game of Death was interrupted in 1972 when he was offered the starring role in a big-budget Hollywood martial arts film. Bruce Lee's amazing talents and international box office appeal had finally broken down Hollywood's wall of prejudice. When it was finally decided that Warner Brothers would make this co-production with Bruce, which ended up to be Enter the Dragon, he was ecstatic. This triumph made Bruce only more driven to succeed. His Chinese language films, though box office hits, earned barely enough to support his family. Adding to his stress were the intense physical demands of the film. Demands so intense that on May 10th, 1973, Bruce Lee collapsed and almost died. He was w working with somebody and he, and he passed out. He was out for a half hour. So he came back, he said they had just finished doing a complete physical examination and they gave him a complete bill of health. They just said, oh, you were just tired, you know, worn out, something, you know. After finishing Enter the Dragon, Bruce immediately returned to work on Game of Death in Hong Kong. During a business meeting, he suffered a severe headache, took a prescription pill offered by a friend and laid down to take a nap. And the phone rang and it was Raymond Chow. And he said, Linda, you have to go to the hospital they're taking Bruce to the hospital. They brought him in and he was unconscious and they were just trying all these life-saving measures on him. Finally, I asked someone who was a medical person standing next to me. I remember thinking in my head, I, I don't wanna ask is if he's died. So I said, is he alive? And they just shook their head. On July 20th, 1973, at the age of 32, Bruce Lee died from an allergic reaction to the prescription pill he'd taken. His family, friends, and fans around the world were stunned. When I first heard it, it was just more shock than, than, than sadness or anything. Didn't have time to think about that. It was just shocking. More than 30,000 mourners crowded the streets of Hong Kong to pay their last respects to their fallen idol. Bruce Lee's funeral was held in Seattle. Among the pallbearers were Robert Lee, Dan Inosanto, Taki Kamora, James Coburn, and Steve McQueen. To see the influence that he had had, you know, like it was still, it was still present in the room. You know, all of the, all of the people that he'd touched was carrying a little piece of, uh, of the knowledge of Bruce. With the death of her husband, Bruce, Linda Lee was left to raise her son, Brandon, and daughter, Shannon, alone. She was also left with the painful task of helping her children to deal with the loss of their beloved father. We tried to talk about Bruce a lot in the months and years that passed, you know, about remember when daddy did this or you did this with daddy or whatever. And yet that was very hard, especially for Brandon. I remember on one occasion he said, stop talking about daddy. He was so hurt. He was so hurt. <laughs> Weren't we all? Fortunately, Linda was able to draw on the same strength of character that had helped her overcome her family's initial rejection of Bruce, Bruce's trials in Hollywood, and their...